Now in this video we will look at a thin uniform rod, so the mass is um, evenly spread throughout the rod. Now we can think of the rod as just having one dimension, so it's got length, so we can just model it as a line segment, so we can forget about its cross-section. We can pretend its cross-sectional area is zero. Since the rod is uniform, the center of mass will be at the midpoint of the rod. So we will imagine that the center of mass is the origin of our coordinate system. We could put in a y-axis here if we want to, but it doesn't really matter because all the action is, long, is along the x-axis. Now to simplify the algebra a bit, what's conventionally done here is to um, say that the rod has length two times some quantity. I'm calling that quantity L. L is half the length of the rod. Rather than saying that the length is L, we say that the length is 2L. Suppose that the mass of the rod is m, and since we will be considering the mass of mass elements, you know, tiny elements, mass delta m, we need to consider the density of this rod, okay? Now, you know, density is usually mass over volume. But since it's meaningless to talk about this rod as having a volume, we say the mass per unit length now that quantity is fixed for a uniform rod, so um, let's call that quantity uh, rho, denoted by the Greek letter rho. Now rho doesn't normally have a little tail on it, but I'm just putting it on it to make it, to distinguish it from the letter P. So rho would be the mass of one meter, one meter length of this rod, okay? So it's rho kilograms per meter, you know, per one meter. So it's mass per unit length rather than mass per unit volume as we normally define density. So the mass is big M, the length we're calling 2L rather than L to simplify the algebra. So we can write the mass of the rod in terms of its length 2L and its uh, density rho. Now of course we what we want to do is get the moment of inertia of all the mass elements that make up this rod. Okay, we want to sum the product of all the mass elements with the distance squared of each mass element to the origin. Um, so what we imagine doing here to make this work is to chop this rod into elements of length delta L. Okay, so L is the length, so a little piece of the rod is delta L, or actually we could say delta X even better because a coordinate system involves an x-axis, so x can be positive or negative. So the mass of this element delta x is delta m, and what about its distance or position r? Well that's just the x-coordinate of this point here, so this point is x, well there's no y-coordinate of course in this situation, so this point is x, x is positive in, in this case for a mass element to the right of the center of mass, but it could be negative if it's over here. Um, now the sign of it doesn't matter because we're going to be squaring it. So R refers to the distance, so we're going to use X. So whether X is positive or negative, we'll be squaring. So the whole thing will be positive. So we want our summation just to involve X, not M. Okay, so how do we replace, how do we write delta M in terms of X? So what we do is we go back, use the fact that the rod is uniform, and it tells us that any piece of mass of the rod divided by its length is a constant, it's rho. So if our mass is delta m, and we divide by the length of that mass ele element, which is delta x, we have to get rho. So now we can say that delta m is rho times delta x. So rho is a constant, never changes regardless of the sizes of the mass elements. So we write rho delta x times x squared. So everything involves x here, that rho is just a constant factor. It can be pulled outside the summation sign. Um, I'll write x squared first here, although it doesn't actually matter, because these are just multiplied. Now I should have been more specific about the moment of inertia, about what particular axis, okay? Because this distance squared is the perpendicular distance of x 
to an axis. So we are talking about an axis that's perpendicular to the rod passing through the center of mass. That's important. Because if the rod is at some angle, well then, um, uh, this distance x is not perpendicular. Like if the rod is like the, if the axis is like this, the perpendicular distance would actually be this distance here. So anyway, that's something important. So the x coordinate of the point gives us the distance to this axis, and we don't have to worry about negative x's. Say so we could have done the same over here. X would be negative, um, but because we're squaring, it doesn't actually matter. Another point I should say is that this moment of inertia is approximately given by this here because we're dealing with a continuous rod and delta m is a tiny piece of the rod but it's not infinite, infinitesimally small. We have to take the limit as delta x approaches zero of this quantity here, rho times sigma x squared delta x. When we do that the summation sign becomes an integral. We replace delta x with dx. So now you could say that we are summing infinitely many of these quantities. So we've made this mass element shrink so that it becomes effectively zero. You know, delta x approaches zero as the length of this mass element. We replace delta x with dx and uh, over what do we integrate? Well, our limits of integration run from this point here. Using our coordinate system, this point here is minus L. And this point here is plus L. So we're summing over all the elements. So we can indicate it here. So this is a straightforward integral. Integral of x squared is a third x cubed. Plug in the upper limit to get a third l cubed. Then we have a minus sign. Then we plug in the lower limit. That's a third times minus l cubed, which is minus a third l cubed. So we end up getting minus minus a third l cubed, which is plus one third l cubed. So our final answer is two thirds rho times l cubed. Now normally we don't want the moment of inertia in terms of the density, rho, the mass per unit length. So we replace rho with the mass of the rod divided by its length, which is 2L. So our moment of inertia about an axis through the midpoint perpendicular to the rod is one third the mass of the rod times half the length of the rod squared. Now let's consider a different problem. Let's consider the moment of inertia of the exact same rod of length 2L and mass per unit length rho, but this time about one end of the rod, about an axis perpendicular to the rod passing through one end of the rod. So I will do this using integration, and uh, I will also do it using the parallel axis theorem that we saw in the last video. So here's our little mass element. We haven't taken the limit yet, so we refer to it as delta M. When we take a limit as delta m approaches zero, delta m becomes dm. Okay, we know its mass in terms of rho is rho times its length. So we'll, we'll say its length is delta x. So x is the left point of this element, and delta x is the change in x that gives us the length of this element. All right, so its moment of inertia is its mass, which is rho delta x, times the square of the distance to the origin. So actually we're taking the distance of the left point of the element to the origin. But that won't matter because when we take limits, delta x will approach zero. So it doesn't matter that x is the left point. Um, so we multiply this by x squared. I'll write the x squared here. Okay, so that's the moment of inertia about this axis for this particular mass element. And we have to do that for all the mass elements that make up this rod. So we're summing over all of them from zero to two L. Okay, the next step, well, well, first of all, I'll just write down that this is the moment of inertia about, we'll call this point O. And it's given approximately by this. It becomes exact when we take limits. So as delta x approaches zero, sigma x squared rho delta x approaches the integral 
of x squared dx. I'll take out the row. Okay, that row, um, that row comes out, of course, it's just a constant. Okay, so again, sigma, the summation sign becomes an integral. Delta x becomes dx. And we're integrating over the entire rod. x runs from 0 up to 2L. All right, so same integral as before. The limits are different. Plug in 2L, so we get 1 third times 2L cubed. Well, that's 8L cubed. And then we minus this thing with 0 in. Well, that's just 0. So lastly, what we do is we plug in for rho. Rho is the mass of the rod divided by the length of the rod. So eventually we find that the moment of inertia about an axis perpendicular to the rod passing through an endpoint is four thirds the mass of the rod times half the length of the rod squared. So now let's compare these two. Notice that the moment of inertia about an endpoint, that's about the point O, is actually four times greater than the moment of inertia of the rod about the center of mass, which is here. So you could say that it's four times more difficult to rotate the rod about an axis through its endpoint perpendicular to the rod than it is about an axis through the center of the rod and perpendicular to the rod. And that makes sense. We know that from experience. Now let's repeat this problem using the parallel axis theorem. So what does the parallel axis theorem tell us? It tells us that the moment of inertia about this axis here is equal to the moment of inertia about an axis through the center of mass and parallel to this axis plus the mass of the rod times the square of the distance between the two axes. Well, this distance is L, so we need to square that distance. So let's check. Okay, well, we have the moment of inertia about um, this axis, which I can call C, the C axis. It's a, it's a toward ML squared. And if we add ML squared onto this, we see very quickly that we get four towards ML squared for the moment of inertia about axis O, which we calculated by integration. So now we don't have to use integration anymore if we know the moment of inertia about the axis through the center of mass and perpendicular to the rod. So if we want the moment of inertia about this particular axis, all we need to do is get this distance. Or this particular axis, all we need is this distance. And plug in here. Okay, so in general, this formula is IC plus M times D squared, where D is the distance between the axes. Okay, so wherever the axis is, we can easily use the parallel axis theorem.